Welcome to another ICS Village production. The ICS Village is a non-profit organization dedicated to the promotion of industrial control system security. Visit our website at icsvillage.com to discover more about us, where to find the village, participate in our community engagement project, and how to sponsor and donate to the ICS Village efforts. Uh, hello, everyone. My name is uh, Stefan, and I am giving a talk today about uh, power system fundamentals. So, a little bit about me. I'm a mechanical engineer by education. Uh, I started off in the electric sector, uh, worked there for about three years for a big power utility, it was in the south. Uh, have about 10 years in InfoSec, uh, six in the Army, National Guard. Uh, passionate about heavy machinery and how computers are sort of intersecting that now. Um, and so the ICS Village seemed like a good place to do a talk. Here's a video of me shooting howitzer for some reason. And those things rock, don't they? Um, and just to show you kind of how relevant it is, um, that's a Paladin M109 Alpha 6. I haven't fired one of the new Alpha 7s. I don't know how the Bradley chassis changes them, but um, the Alpha 6 has uh, computers inside for fire control. And it's able to process missions and um, do that, all that uh, using computers and has been for some time. And uh, in most NATO countries, that's the way it works. Um, so not that that's what this talk is about, but just to kind of show you how pervasive um, computers in uh, these traditionally um, non-computer machines is. So. All right, so I'm not going to bore you with this slide too much, but you know we all know there's threats to the grid, uh, legacy systems running outdated operating systems, you know old operating systems and secure protocols, um, no identity access management, um, and with incidents like the attack on Ukraine and the power on the power grid and uh, the Colonial Pipeline. Um, it's just becoming more and more a fact of life that this is something that we have to contend with in the future. So the grid um, is a little bit unique uh, because it's pervasive. Uh, there's not much that we have that works without electricity. Your computer, this building, um, everything. So when it comes to industrial control systems, uh, it's kind of a bedrock for all the other ones because uh, nothing really works without it. And unlike a lot of other ICS systems, um, it's it's pretty much it's pretty much everywhere, um, and it's also distributed. So unlike a lot of industrial control systems that have the um, nice aspect that they can be relatively contained, like in sort of the aerospace industry or in manufacturing or in um, you know uh, oil, petrochemical refining. Um, the grid is everywhere because you need to put the infrastructure in to make anything run. And not just that, but lots of large and small businesses have their own energy distribution networks um, to uh, distribute energy uh, themselves. And some even have their own transmission networks. The one I'm primarily thinking of is, of course, like data centers and uh, other cloud service providers that uh, have their own transmission. Um, a few even have their own generation fleets. Uh, companies uh, like uh, BP, people that actually do oil extraction, mineral uh, mining and gas, um, they actually have to have their own generation fleets uh, along with the military. Um, if you've ever been deployed uh, in Iraq or Afghanistan, you know like a lot of the FOBs have their own generation in place on those bases because they, uh, they can't rely on it being there for them. Not just an energy utility problem. Um, so this talk is primarily about some of the physics that underlie the power grid because um, you can't really understand how to protect or attack a system that you don't understand how it works. Um, so you don't want to just be 
tuning alerts uh, that just got turned on for no reason. And likewise, as an attacker, you don't just want to be throwing out random exploits um, and random vulnerability scans when you don't even know what you're scanning or doesn't matter. Um, and you'd think that'd be intuitive, right? Like you can't really do web app security without knowing what a GET request is. Um, it's also important for things like wargaming, tabletop exercises, you think grid X, if you want the game to mean anything more than just a dice roll, like in Dungeons and Dragons, you actually have to have a simulation that actually is representative of what exists in real life. Um, and it's also important for POCs, right? So whenever you're trying to sell a POC to somebody or try to explain why um, their system being vulnerable matters, um, you always have to come up with some kind of so what in the end of your report. And that ends up coming down to something like, well, you know, if the relay gets compromised and the setting gets messed with, um, you know, the zone one impedance um, is changed, then it could, you know, uh, cut off a tie line and then could throw the grid into a, the system into an unstable state and cause a whole system collapse. It needs to be something like that. Um, and you need to also know what systems matter and what don't, because not all PLCs and RTUs are created equal. Um, it's also important to realize that like ransomware is bad, that is true, but it's not the only thing that we need to worry about. So let's just start off with a base. I'm not trying to be childish to anyone, but like a basic understanding of like what is electricity. Because we, we all throw it around a lot, but um, this is kind of the talk I wanted to actually, if nobody, people don't know, um, what actually electricity is. So um, electricity, by Oxford definition, is the movement of energy, so it's the energy, that is the result of moving charged particles, either static, uh, statically or as an accumulation of charge, uh, or dynamically as a current. In a power system, the charge carriers are typically the electrons. In digital systems, it's sometimes the proton, but not always. Um, and the charge fundamental unit uh, is the coulomb, denoted by C. And uh, one coulomb is equal to 6.24 times 10 to the 18th electrons. Uh, and there's a reason for that, and it has to do with Andre Ampere and silver nitrate and how much electricity it takes to uh, isolate silver. That's a long story. Um, and so from there, that base unit, we can determine what an amp is, which is one coulomb per second. Um, and so from there, we also have voltage. And voltage is the measurement of energy per coulomb, or energy per unit charge. And one volt is the, defined as one joule per coulomb. Um, and if you don't know what a joule is, it's a fundamental unit of energy denoted by newton meters. Newton is a form of force. Um, and so from there, once we have our definition of uh, voltage and current, we can go on to our definition of uh, power, which is what we really care about. Um, and in electricity, the primary unit of power is the watt, uh, which is measured in joules per second. Um, to get power flow, it's pretty simple. We uh, already have uh, joules per coulomb and coulombs per second. So to get power in a simple DC circuit where we have a constant current and voltage, all we need to do is multiply the two together to get watts. Um, in the case of alternating current, which we'll see in a second, this gets a little bit more complicated. So not much in the power sector actually uses DC power. There are some exceptions. Um, generation uses DC power because it primarily uses an electromagnet. Um, and then also some of the supporting systems for a lot of the substations use DC power. But for actual transmission, it's not used. But it's still important to understand the essentials. Um, and most of DC volt uh, power analysis can be done with three basic laws um, and then just be clever about how you use them. So there's Ohm's law, which is voltage equals the resistance times the current. Uh, Kirchhoff's voltage law, which is just the law that says that the sum of the voltages in any current in any loop uh, equals zero. And Kirchhoff's current law, which basically just says that when you have uh, charge and you're summing it into any node, uh, charge does not build up. So therefore, charge in must equal charge out. 
Uh, so basic circuit components. Um, this is a resistor, which is denoted by R. We have a capacitor, which stores charge <coughs> in the form of uh, electrical, electrical potential. An inductor, which stores energy in the form of magnetic potential. A switch, which in AC is called a, a breaker, or kind of similar. In AC, in AC uh, circuits, a lot of times they have similar words, or different words for very similar things, so it can be confusing sometimes. And then we have a, a battery, or a D, which doesn't always need to be a battery, it's just a DC source, it usually is a battery, but it can also be something like a, uh, a solar cell, for example. Um, and then to determine power flow, this is pretty simple. Um, we, uh, we just use Ohm's Law, KCL, and KVL. And then uh, when we have more than one of these devices in there, um, we just come up with the overall total. For resistors, it's pretty simple. We just add resistors together when they're in series. And then to find the equivalent resistance when they're in parallel, it's simply uh, the inverse of the sum of one over each resistance added together. And this also works the same for batteries and also for inductors. Uh, capacitors are the opposite. Capacitors add in parallel, and then in series it's one over the inverse of one over the sum of the capacitor. So here's just a basic sample of DC power. So you have five volts, two, uh, two voltage sources, two constant voltage sources, and then two resistors. You um, add the two voltage sources together to get the total voltage. You add the total resistors together, get the total resistance, and then you find the uh, overall current by dividing voltage by resistance. So that gives you half an amp. And then power is simply the voltage times the, uh, the overall voltage drop times the current, uh, which gives you 7.5 watts. And the current, of course, is constant because there's only one loop here. And then to find the uh, power running through each unit, we just simply do the same. Uh, we multiply the current times the voltage drop across each equivalent resistor. AC power gets a little bit more complicated. Um, now, instead of having just a static voltage, you have one that alternates over time. Uh, this is normally in a sinusoidal wave. Um, so we have power or voltage, current, and power uh, both following this format. Uh, trans we do this because transmitting AC is much more efficient and leads to a lot less loss over transmission lines than direct current does. If we all use direct current to this day, uh, like Edison wanted us to, we would uh, have an energy crisis that's about 100 times worse than Since voltage and current uh, vary over time, now we have to write this, uh, their equations like this. It's not a constant value. We have a magnitude, and then we have a real part, which is given by the cosine, and an imaginary part, which is given by J sine. So we don't, we don't use I for imaginary number in alternating current. We use J because uh, we use I for current. We don't want to get those confused. So J is the square root of negative one. Um, we call the omega value the frequency and the phi value the phase. Um, and to make the math easier, we uh, normally talk in terms of root mean squared value, which is simply the value of the magnitude over the square root of two. Um, or there's this, uh, you can take the integral and find it that way by taking the square root over the sum, which in this case is an integral over a trigonometric function. Um, another way to think about it is a line of constant length um, that's angle is constantly increasing. Uh, so this is basically like a vector, right? So it has a set magnitude and a set angle, except uh, the idea with this is that it's constantly rotating. So we call a vector that's constantly rotating, we call that a phaser. And um, a phaser has a magnitude, an angle, an offset angle, um, yeah, so it looks like a vector, but it's not because it's working. And thanks to Euler's uh, formula, we use what's called Euler's notation, which is where we use it in terms of a magnitude times um, e to the something, so that we don't have to write out cosines and sines quite as much. So uh, 
notation-wise, it looks like an I with a little squiggly line over it, IRMS times E to the J, fire, J omega, or whatever it is, plus an offset angle. Uh, so voltage and current now both have imaginary components, so power does too, makes sense. So we have two components of power now. We have active or real power, and we have reactive power. Um, so active power is the thing that you actually sell. You can't sell imaginary power. Um, but you still need it in order to balance out your circuit a lot of times. Um, but it also changes the formula for uh, finding the power. Power is no longer just voltage times current. It is now the voltage phasor times the complex conjugate of the current phasor. Um, and the complex conjugate is, sounds complicated. It's not. It's just the um, negative sign, or you just reverse the sign of the imaginary part. Uh, and we also now have the concept of the power factor, alpha, which is just simply the uh, voltage offset angle uh, subtracted from the current offset angle. That comes in to being very important later on. Typically, you want to minimize those as a grid operator. Um, however, all the laws from DC still hold true. They're just different. So Ohm's law is now um, the voltage phasor drop is the current phasor times what we call now the impedance. So we don't have inductance and capacitance or resistance, we just have impedance, which has a real and an imaginary component to it. But KCL and KVL still hold true. Um, the sum of the voltage phasors still equals zero in any given loop, and the sum of the current phasors at any given node are still equal to zero. And as well as, you know, the first law of thermodynamics, that still holds true. The total power still sums to zero. Um, but the thing you have to be careful about is that real power and reactive power uh, do not always sum to zero because one can be turned into the other. So in most power systems in the world, we transmit power over three phases, not just one. Why? Because it's a lot more stable. A lot of times in... Um, common use, we transfer, we change AC into DC power. And for something like a motor, um, if you wanted to do that, you use something called a rectifier. Uh, it's a pretty simple circuit, but the problem is, is that you end up with, um, you end up with a half-wave circuit that essentially has a lot of uh, emptiness there, which would make your motors run funny, it would make your lights flicker. Um, so to compensate for that, we use three phases, and then we can have something that approximates uh, a constant voltage across the line. And we can use a very simple circuit to do it, which is oh, this thing right here, which is all it is, is just basically three thyristors. Thyristors are basically diodes. Everybody knows what a diode is, right? Okay. Um, and then you have three thyristors with three different phases, and then you get basically a uh, a, a DC wave. Um, it's or not a DC current. Um, it's also cheaper, uh, also cheap and durable AC motors. Um, they also work well on three phase. You can just use three phase power. You don't actually need to turn it into direct current as well because you have those three phases. Um, it comes in two main configurations, uh, delta and Y. Y is a little bit different because it has a, a neutral end to it um, and delta does not. Um, when the three phases are 120 degrees, or typically we use radians because the math works out easier, out of, uh, two pi over three radians out of phase, we say that the amplitude and the amplitudes are equal. We say that um, the system is essentially balanced. So that's where this is true. Where VA equals um, cosine omega t plus theta, and then phase B is omega t minus 120, omega t minus 240 for phase C and they have a uh, constant magnitude. Uh, when a linear system has, has a balanced set of three-phase currents flowing in uh, and three-phase balanced voltages, we say that the system is symmetric. This is important because most fault analysis techniques used by engineers run off the assumptions that most systems are symmetric. Um, when the systems become unbalanced, we use what are called symmetrical components to analyze the problem. What are symmetrical components? Well, 
what happens when you have a balance system that now has become unbalanced? Um, this can happen for a variety of reasons, the most common being a fault, but not necessarily. Um, something can cause your phases to become unbalanced, such as um, poor design of the grid, of the uh, distribution system. Um, you can also have unexpected load on the, on the system, um, or a lack of load that you weren't expecting. Um, but the point is, is that it's different than uh, DC current in that uh, you just have a drop in resistance which causes a spike in current and you just want to flip a breaker. That's not always the best idea in this case. A lot of times there's easier ways to uh, balance load um, on the grid. Um, so how do we break it? So we have our unbalanced load. Um, so how do we analyze like, what's actually going on here? Um, well, we break down our unbalanced load into basically three balanced loads, essentially. And that gives us some idea of how unbalanced our load is. And we call those the positive sequence, the negative sequence, and the zero sequence. Um, essentially using some linear algebra, we define three different, three sets of phasers. Um, one, where, and uh, two of them, our positive and our negative sequence, are each of the same magnitude and 120 degrees out of phase, and a zero sequence, which is all in phase and all has the same magnitude. Um, the only difference between the positive and the negative sequence is that the phase C and uh, phase B are flipped. You can see here. Um, and this will help give us some idea of how the system is actually unbalanced itself. And this is actually really important because this is actually how a lot of fault analysis is conducted. So understanding this is pretty important because essentially what this is telling you is if your positive sequence is equal to the actual measurements, then you're totally balanced. Um, if you have a negative sequence or a zero sequence, then something is unbalanced if those are not zero. Um, yeah. So how do we do this? How do we break this down? Oh, we can come up with uh, Three equations are IA, IB, IC, that's what we have, and then three, uh, a zero, a positive, and a negative, and uh, we have nine unknowns and three equations. Uh, how are we going to solve this? Well, we define what our positive and negative sequences are, and that they are 120 degrees out of phase, so while it looks like we have nine unknowns, we actually only have three. We define each phaser's relationship uh, with each of them for the symmetrical components. And we know that each of them are 120 degrees out of phase. So what do we do? We come up with a term called alpha, or A, which we define to be uh, e to the 120 or 2 pi over 3 times j. And we know that from Euler's law, we can essentially, that's that e to the negative i pi rule, that we can essentially multiply any phaser by a um, e to some angle and uh, imaginary number, and we, it's the same thing as rotating, essentially. So with that in mind, we can just come up with a transformation matrix, which we have here, and we can put our um, I A, I B, I C that we've measured in terms of the symmetrical components. So we only need one symmetrical component for each. So we can have, instead of having three positive sequence currents and three positive sequence voltages, we have one positive sequence voltage, one uh, negative sequence voltage, and one zero sequence voltage, or current in this case. Um, and essentially we can put those in terms of the transformation matrix, and it's simply T times um, those symmetrical components gives us what we actually have. Um, and that makes life really easy, right? Because then all we need to do is take the inverse of that matrix, which we can use MATLAB for, and then we have, we just do some multiplication, and then we get our actual volt, and then that actually gives us our uh, breakdown of uh, sequence volt, sequence currents. Excuse me. So a practical example. So we've got this uh, circuit right here, and we got a fault along here. And we know what the impedances are, we know what the measured voltages are. How do we solve for the distance along that line? Well, we break the current down into symmetrical components, the symmetrical impedances, because if we can break it down into symmetrical voltages and currents, 
we can also come up with symmetrical impedances. So that turns this circuit into this one. Um, and then it's simply using a matter of uh, Kirchhoff's current law to write our voltage equations in terms of M. Uh, we then use substitution to solve for M. And uh, then we find our distance along the line. Some, same way that you would do it for like a basic fault if you had a DC circuit, essentially. So it makes the math way easier. Uh, so in a perfectly balanced system, like I said earlier, uh, you wouldn't have symmetrical components because everything would be 120 degrees out of phase and uh, have equal magnitudes. The negative and zero sequence tell you basically how out of balance you are. The zero is most commonly used for like ground faults and the um, negative sequence is most commonly used for line-to-line -line faults. This is important because it tells you what you need to add or remove in order to bring the system back into balance. Or importantly, what an attacker would need to bring the system out of balance. So it's kind of a two-phase uh, two approach there. Um, yeah, it's also important, just one last thing, it's also important just because line faults typically can't be measured with just a straight up impedance, uh, lack of impedance measurement. Because you're, you're still going to have, you won't have a straight drop in impedance um, because you'll, uh, power is still flowing, but it's partly flowing into the lines. So probably one of the most important um, control systems on the grid, apart from capacitor banks, is uh, transformers. Pretty simple concept, just an oscillating electric field which uh, is conducted through a magnet to another oscillate, uh, to another current line, which conducts another oscillating field, uh, which generates uh, a sympathetic current. And uh, <coughs> using the ratio of the windings, we can tell how much it's either stepped up or stepped down. Uh, since power is conserved, the math's actually pretty easy. It's just uh, that multiplication again. Uh, voltage times the uh, complex conjugate of the current. Gets a little more complicated though when you start having multiple phases in it. Um, you have, for example, this which is for a uh, variable tap under load, but we have different forms of analysis that we can use like a pi equivalent model, which forms it in terms of basically one series component, what we call two shunt components, which are uh, listed in terms of resistance in a tap setting. Um, special transformers with variable windings are used to regulate power on the grid. Um, these, are, these are used for regulating um, transformers that regulate voltage magnitude and phase have a special name, they're called phase shifters. Um, and these can be used to uh, basically adjust when you have those out of phase components and you have that negative sequence component and a non-zero zero, zero sequence component. You can modify the tap set in, in order to bring voltage and current back into balance. Um, some other important electrical components, because I'm running out of time, we don't have time to go over it, are uh, generators that make most of the electricity, uh, capacitor banks that are used to uh, add or remove. It's another technique of bringing the uh, grid back into balance. Static bar compensators, uh, which are used to add or remove reactive power. Uh, current limiting reactors, which are used to uh, temporarily absorb load and prevent power spikes from things like shorts. And then uh, photovoltaics, which um, work on a circuit level similar to batteries, but they get power from the sun, so their voltage actually varies so a little bit. So in conclusion, you can't effectively attack or defend any system that you don't really understand first, which is kind of why I put this talk together. Um, and DC is not too hard to get, but AC is where it gets more complicated. Um, and then balancing the three-phase system is actually pretty tricky um, because you have bars that you have to worry about. You have that reactive power. But by understanding it, um, we can better secure slash attack. Um, power system. So that's pretty much my talk. Does anybody have any questions? Yes. In regards to like, from a tech perspective, they do this with like, I guess. I'm sorry, I can't hear you. No, sorry. In regards to a tech perspective, uh -huh. um, who would actually see would be like the actual operator? operators? So, you know, the changes in the phase? Yes. Yeah. 
so the yeah, so the grid operators they have like a Siemens product or an ADB product. I think it's called like Spider, yeah. and they'll actually see like changes in the symmetrical components um, on different lines. So the second part of the question. Well, it depends. It, it depends. It depends. And that's the thing, right? So, like, how is that line supposed to normally work? What are, what are the different, um, like, positive sequence impedance setting that's supposed to be there? Well, how is the line designed? What's the, what's the impedance on the line? And then what is a realistic setting for, like, how long that line is um, to find, like, a short? Something so, like that. Hmm? So a question to ask them would be like, from a perspective, like, what's your baseline, what's your impedance? Yeah, but it's not, it, the, the baseline, I guess what I'm saying here is the baseline has like a physical component to it, okay. if that makes sense. It's yeah. more like, what is the length of the line? Okay. And this is what the impedance should be. It's not like, what do you guys set it at? It's, it's an actual physical, that's why I did this talk, to like express like it's an actual physical value that it should be. Like it shouldn't be more than 120 or 140, like the zone one protection, which I didn't talk about. But like for um, setting the impedance for a relay to trigger and open the circuit, that has like a defined setting that it shouldn't go above or below. And um, unless there's a certain reason, right? Like, did you have to open another relay and overload a certain line because um, you had to drop load or you had to isolate a line because somebody's doing repair work or something like that? So those are all things that you need to understand in order to, uh, for a sock person, for example, to be like, well, is it normal for them to open it up? So, so much of it, I'm not gonna, I don't wanna go on a rant here, but so much of the security strategy that I see is kind of like, just look at one thing is not like the other, and it doesn't worry about like actually understanding the system that you're looking at. So that's kind of what this talk was about. Yes? Uh, so imagine this for hunting on uh, ICS stuff. Uh -huh. Maybe just stick with the HMIs and the uh, engineering workstations. We haven't gotten into the Right. Um, so what do you think the resources other than this right here you recommend to understand? I'm sorry. Yeah, you're right. I am. I'm sorry I didn't mention this. Yes, there is a great reference. It's called the IEEE Red Book. <laughs> it's uh, it's a giant book on um, electrical protection and like all of the all of the different techniques and like what IEEE approves of. And so you guys have heard of it, I guess. Somebody's heard of it. Uh, but yeah, it's it's massive. But yes. Yes. Are there any special considerations for high voltage DC transform or transmission? Because there are parts of the US that do use high voltage DC to reach different points You know, um, to be honest, I don't know much about the, D uh, the people that use high voltage DC. I know it is a thing. Where, where in the country is that a thing? I have heard of it. Uh, there's multiple parts. I don't know about the top of my head. I just know it is a thing. Uh, okay. I mean, it's usually the analysis is usually easier because it's just a it's just a, con, a constant curve. But the thing is, is you can't um, you can't balance your circuit, you can't balance your system um, using things like um, like capacitor banks and inductors because you're going to like cause a wave to like go all over, or it will become a wave. So your your options for protection are much more limited. Um, you have things like. Um, you have, you have breakers, but you also have, uh, I forget what they're called. Um, the, like they use them on trains. It's like a, basically a high frequency switch that opens and closes real fast. So you can, it's, it's kind of like dropping current, but not really. Um, so yeah, those are some of the, I guess that, that's, does that answer your question? Sure. Okay. Anyone else have any questions? All right, cool. Well, hope you all enjoyed my talk. Thank you for joining us for another ICS Village production. Be sure to like and subscribe to the channel. Find us on icsvillage.com to become involved with our community.